And today we're going to be chatting about computational design. So, Michael, I mentioned that you've been at the DIFF before. In fact, you uh, closed out the final session of the first Disruptive Innovation Festival in 2014. Uh -huh. And I've actually got a quote that you said on stage at that session, which I'm going to read out to you now to okay. jog your memory. You said, humans are actually a very ingenious species. And one of the very appealing things about the age that we are entering is that I think we'll see a massive reawakening of that ingenuity. So it's been four years since you said those words. Mm. Do you stand by them now today? Do you, see that we've, do you think that we've seen that reawakening happen already? Or is it still um, yet to arrive? Well, I mean, I wish we were seeing that reawakening happening much more quickly. And frustratingly, it's, it's not happening anywhere near as quickly as it should be. And, you know, the, the latest IPCC report was a, a real wake up call. And I sincerely hope that will be a, a, a sort of driver of, of much more rapid action. Because, I mean, one of the bizarre things about the age we're in is that we have nearly all the solutions we need to shape a really positive future. And it's not happening at anywhere near the pace that it should be. I think it's worth making a distinction between the early versions of CAD or computer aided design and the, the more recent forms of computational design. So when drawing first moved over to, to computers, it was a fairly direct translation. The computer was just doing what had previously done, been done with a pen or a pencil. The thinking was still being done by the humans. But the amazing thing about computational design is it really draws on much more of the computer's power. So it could, a lot more of that logic and processing can be done by the computer. And that means that you can work through not just, say, tens of options, but literally tens of thousands of options. And by doing that, at least in principle, arrive at a much better all-around solution. Now we are at a moment that there is a big change into how we design. Our designs, um, they are now being informed by parameters that until now, first of all, we didn't have access to, and second of all, we didn't have the manual or intellectual power to work with that. No? Computation is helping us to deal with um, a big amount of data and this allows us to create designs they are, that they are much more optimized and they are much more informed uh, on parameters, uh, from parameters that they are relevant to what we want to achieve. Sustainability parameters, environmental parameters, users' desires parameters, um, uh, resources that surround uh, what we construct, uh, all those have been um, basically numbers that they were very difficult to manage to bring together into a design um, a decision or into a design process. Michael, she made uh, two points in that clip that I'd like to chat about for a while. Uh, the first was uh, a word that she used, this idea of parameters, mm -hmm. and that computational design is giving us the ability to bring these parameters sustainability parameters, environmental parameters, I think she yeah. said user needs parameters into our design. What does she mean by parameters exactly? Well, it's the, maybe a simpler way of putting it is, is the, the different uh, aspects of performance that you want the building to meet, perhaps in terms of the amount of light you want in, the amount of um, external space you want for each residential unit, the access to sunlight, the proximity to transport nodes, that kind of thing. and. Often, when you're, when you're designing, say, a new piece of city, you've got a lot of those different parameters that you're trying to optimize and, and form trade-offs between. And it's pretty difficult to do that by conventional means. I remember when I was a student, um, Sir Norman Foster was working on the design for the new BBC building. Um, it, it wasn't actually built. It was a different version that was built. But I think his model shop made something like 100 different physical models. And Everyone thought that was absolutely amazing, you know, that they could go through that many options. But with computational design, and if you set the parameters that you want, you can work through literally thousands and thousands of options and, and arrive at something that, that has resolved the, the sort of trade-offs between a lot of those different ones that are potentially in conflict. Okay, this, this reminds me of um, an article I was reading before this, uh, when I was trying to just kind of get my own head around what computational design is and what it offers. Um, and it talked about 
kind of there being two elements to design, that there's the conceptual element of design where you're coming up with the ideas, you're kind of trying to meet the brief, and then the other element is the actual doing of it, the, the, the physical creation of models and testing. Yeah. And so what you're saying really is that part of the power of computational design now is the ability to like rapidly, virtually kind of test almost an infinite number or at least thousands of versions of the same design or slightly tweaked design yes. to reach kind of the desired output. Is that yeah, yeah. And one of the reasons it appeals to me is because it's, it's getting closer to the way that biological evolution has worked. I mean, you could look at each organism as the result of a, a very long process of refinement according to a very complex set of parameters. And, you know, that has taken hundreds of millions of years. The great thing about computational design is you can compress that into maybe one or two days of uh, powerful computing. Brilliant. This is quite a good one to start with because it just uses a couple of parameters. And it was inspired by this example from biology. So this branching system demonstrates what's referred to as Murray's law. Murray's law is a, a mathematical constant that appears to hold true for most branching systems in biology. There's a very constant ratio between the diameters of the parent vessel and the daughter vessels. And then there's also quite a constant angle at which the branching occurs. And then there's a certain finessing to those junctions. And overall, this appears to be a, 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 um, an evolved optimum way of uh, conducting gases and liquids around a biological organism. Mm -hmm. So we first use this to design a zero carbon data center. So instead of having the data blocks arranged in long straight runs, which would have had a lot of pipe work with a lot mm -hmm. of 90 degree bends, we clustered them like this and then designed that branching system based on Murray's law. And then we had an opportunity to take this a bit further. We were working on a tender for a, a massive new water treatment facility in the Middle East. And this was an existing facility. And you can see that it's all quite rectilinear. It's quite a lot yeah. of space between the elements. And why, when I first looked at that, I thought, well, that, that doesn't look like a great layout to me. And um, my um, colleague, who's a, an engineer, turned to me and said, well, isn't that rather arrogant of you as an architect to think you could improve on something that engineers have been working on for decades? And I said, well, well, hold on, hold on. It's not really about being arrogant. It's about being curious. And we knew that this tender was going to be determined partly based on, on, the, partly based on the capital cost and partly based on 10 years running cost. Now, 10 years running cost for something as energy intensive as this is huge. Yes. So I suggested that we could use a, a biological a computational tool to try and optimize this. So my kind of grumpy colleague conceded that, yes, OK, if we could make a one or two percent saving in energy, then that would be worth having. It sounds like something an engineer would be drawn to. Well, I don't want to make any sweeping <laughs> statements. So well, like <laughs> I studied engineering, so I feel like I can comment. OK. Uh, so one of my colleagues in the office developed this little tool. So this, this shows a hypothetical layout. The white circles are pieces of equipment, and then you've got a pipe uh, layout that connects them. And what the tool does is it works out the optimum relative positioning of the pieces of equipment, the white circles, and it also optimizes the branching angle according to Murray's law. And the figures at the bottom there, you can see that the total length of pipework came down uh, from 100 to just below 64. And then we took that a step further. This one starts in a few moments. Uh, this was a a completely accurate uh, sequence of equipment for a proper water treatment facility, all, all in the right um, form. And this time we combined the figures for length and angle. Each bend you put into a system adds a certain amount of equivalent length in terms of friction. So that figure of total equivalent length is a very good measure of the amount of friction in the system and therefore the amount of energy required. And you can see that here we came down to well below 40% of the starting point. The eventual layout is not quite as aesthetically appealing, but this is a, this is a functional tool. Yeah. So you, you can see from that that we could learn a lot from taking lessons from biology combined with computational design to arrive at a, a much more refined and efficient layout. I mean, it certainly seems like incredible savings. And, and it's just, it is fascinating to see the, that original image you showed of the leaf and that organic form and how the computer, I suppose, has taken that very kind of grid, rectilinear um, layout and created what, to my eyes, looks like an organic, kind of biologically inspired, certainly, um, shape. I'm 
interested um, just to bring back the, the sort of words that Areti used in, in, in her clip, this idea of parameters. Yes. In, in this example, what, what would have been the parameters, say, that you were inputting into the um, simulation? It would have been uh, minimizing pipe length, optimizing angle, and I think that was it. So this was really quite a simple one. It was just those two main parameters. One thing you need to remember is that with architecture, you can't necessarily define everything. Some people feel a bit nervous about these, these sort of tools, you know, is everything going to be overtaken by robots? Mm -hmm. And actually there are certain aspects to architecture that I think would be very difficult to do computationally. Yes. So cultural aspects or, or psychological aspects such, a, such as what does it feel like to be in this atrium of a particular shape? And so we didn't necessarily accept everything that the computational tool suggested was optimum. No. We, we, we introduced some other well, we, we use this, a certain amount of judgment in yes. deciding what to take from it. And what this example uh, I liked about this was that it kind of takes it to a, a, a bigger picture level. And um, so we start to see what the potential of computational design can be. Yeah. Um, I'll leave it up to you. Great. So this is one that we developed on, on the Sahara Forest Project. So the Sahara Forest Project involves bringing together a number of synergistic technologies um, in, in useful ways. And uh, this diagram shows the main cluster of uh, technologies. Those are the green icons. And then we're using what we have a lot of, sunlight, seawater, and carbon dioxide, to produce more of what we need, things like materials and food and oxygen. Now, the, the model that this was based on was an ecosystem model, where each of those technologies has its own inputs and outputs. And we try to connect those up so that every bit of underutilized resource from one part of the system is used by something else in the system. And that's very similar to an ecosystem where you've got loads of interdependent species. It's a zero waste system in which the waste from one becomes the nutrient for something else. And this is very applicable to, to cities. Now in conventional urban planning, we've tended to separate the, the different systems of food, energy, water, and waste. The, those are the main ones. And the problem with separating those is that, that that tends to lead to linear and wasteful ways of doing things. So we can learn a lot from applying these kind of ecosystem models to urban design. Now, one of the things that's quite challenging about these is that they can be quite complicated because you've got a lot of interconnections and is also dynamic. I think we should keep that in perspective. It's, it's not that far beyond the kind of complexity we're used to. If, if you take the example of, say, the number of meals served in London every day. You know, roughly 20 million meals are served every day in London without any significant interruptions in supply or shortages and so on. And that's because that system is largely self-organizing. There's a lot of sort of feedback loops there and, and that's, that's evolved over time. So these, I would argue, are not any more complex than systems that we're already used to. But even so, what we did is we developed a, a design tool which is called City Circ 1.0, which makes it easier to design these. So this allows you to enter a technology or a land use or a process, and you can enter the inputs and outputs, and then you can see ways of connecting these up. And at every point, the tool shows you anything that is underutilized. And that is a, a kind of prompt, really, for, for designers to think, okay, if something's underutilized, then that's a clue that we should add something to the system to create more value. And then what this tool allows you to do is to press play and you can see how it operates. You can see if there are any problems. And this also allows you to test for resilience. So you could choose any one of those links and you could cut it. And if you get a wider system breakdown, then that indicates that you need to add something in terms of um, re redundancy or duplication to make it more resilient, or sometimes add a form of buffering uh, commonly at some sort of form of storage. So this makes it easier to, to both design it and visualize it so you can see what's going on. Um, and by doing that, it, it makes it easier to design for this kind of complexity. Yeah. It makes me think of um, the idea of industrial symbiosis, the Absolutely. connecting yeah. of, kind of multiple businesses or um, production plants, process plants, and making sure that all of the outputs and the inputs from all of those you know, up until now completely distinct and separate streams of what we think of as waste 
and being able to see it, visualize, as you say, how you can use each and every one of those to yeah. create a much more healthy system. Yeah. Uh, I would presume designers out there might be a little bit uh, nervous, frightened about what this technology means. Yeah. Um, and so that idea that this is not a replacement for designers, but kind of is a tool in their arsenal, Absolutely. seems to be what yeah, you're hinting it's, at. It's a, it's a tool that should help us design much better buildings. So you know, if you take an example of, say, a housing development, uh, this would make it easier to ensure that every single housing unit has a good amount of light, uh, a good amount of access to external space, um, a generous amount of sunlight, and so on. Whereas, you know, uh, using more conventional means, you might end up with some some of the housing units that are really rather poor in, in, in certain respects. So, so yeah, I, th I think this is absolutely a tool rather than something that, that becomes our master. And we can, we can still inject uh, plenty of our imagination and creativity into it.